Welcome to season 23 of the Business Infrastructure Podcast. Hi there, I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre, host of the Business Infrastructure Podcast. Before we get started, subscribe to this channel, hit the notification bell so that you'll know when other episodes come. Welcome back to season 23 of the Business Infrastructure Podcast, the show where we share operational tips, tactics, and strategies to help you cure any back office blues you might be experiencing. I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre, and we are at the midway point of our masterclass in growth strategies. At this point, we've talked about how to vet and validate your ideas for growth, how to create a strategic growth plan that includes validated ideas, and how to develop project plans to implement your company's growth strategy. Growth comes in many shapes, forms, and scales of magnitude. One way to grow is through partnerships, and that's what we're going to focus on next. This is episode 292. Karen Mills explains how to structure legal teaming agreements for strategic growth. Karen, I must tell you, I'm so excited about this episode. Ever since I met you many years ago, I've admired your legal acumen. And now here we are. You've not only agreed to come onto the show again, but you're also actively helping me and my company with forming some key partnerships. I can't wait for everyone else to hear why I say you're one of the most brilliant attorneys I've ever met. How are you today? I am doing well, thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Before we delve into the topic of teaming agreements, I'd like to share a little bit about your bio. You are a founding member of Mills Law LLC, which is a law firm specializing in corporate transactional law, contracts law, technology law, and mediation services. You also founded another company called Gimos, and it's there where you offer business consulting and training services. I always think it's fascinating how people have landed where they are in life when you meet them. Karen, you have a background in electrical engineering, but you're also an attorney. Considering your specialty in teaming agreements, what type of law did you study? Well, you know, it's so funny. It's that in law school, you know, we always think of it as we all come out of law school knowing pretty much the same thing because we're all taking basically the first couple of years the same information. And then, you know, you can uh, you have a little bit of flexibility that second year and then definitely your third year to take more elective. So I figure, you know, we all come out knowing uh, the same thing. But I always laugh and say that it was two things that I knew going into law school that I didn't want to do. I didn't want to do criminal law and I didn't want to do litigation. Now, outside of that, you know, once you because, of course, I clerked at a midsize firm uh, and at an intellectual property boutique uh, during the first and second summers of law school. I actually started off in the patent group and I ended up working for about the first year and a half. On um, we had uh, three patent interferences declared at one time and patent interferences, you know, when you are going to two parties that are what I call fighting over very, very valuable property rights of patents. But it's patent litigation. So remember, I said two things I didn't want to do going to law school. (laughs) So when I got stuck doing that patent litigation for about a year and a half, I was so over it. So they moved me into corporate mergers and acquisitions. That's how I started doing corporate transactional contracts and business law. When I moved into corporate mergers and acquisitions, I started understanding better, you know, the financial decisions going behind why to pursue certain patents and doing certain things. So I ended up really liking the transactional aspect of things. I now like to help uh, entrepreneurs and business owners. I help them form their entity. And I also will help them sell their entity as well. And a lot of things in between. And a lot of things in between is usually contract review, negotiation, and drafting. So if that, that's kind of how I summarize what I do. And I've been actually, I thought about it a few weeks ago. I'm actually getting ready to start my 25th year of the practice of law. Wow. 25 years. That's amazing. Well, congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Now, part of that 25-year journey as an attorney not only included your stint working for other law firms, but also starting your first firm, which ironically involved a partnership with another attorney. 
And since 2011, you opened your own firm. What I find interesting is your previous partnership. It's a great segue into the topic of teaming agreements, starting with mergers and acquisitions. It might surprise some listeners to know that mergers and acquisitions, or M&As, can happen between two small companies, right? That's correct. So what is a merger and acquisition, and how is it different from a teaming agreement? When you're talking about mergers and acquisitions, it's typically where you might have one entity that is interested in acquiring all of the assets, everything of another entity, or uh, they may not necessarily want to acquire all aspects of it, maybe just certain funds. So, you know, instead of where you have uh, one entity, I'll take it and merge it in with another where it becomes part of that particular organization. It's only certain aspects or certain visions of it that I, that, that particular buyer might be interested. In. But when you're talking about teaming with other individuals or other entities, you're both running your own um, companies and you jointly agree, you know, to be able to uh, manage or operate. You could operate a separate uh, legal entity as well. Or you can have your company and the other individual has their company and you're coming together and you are going to jointly produce a particular product or perform a particular service. Um, You can also have certain scenarios where you have individuals and companies come together to even do, you know, things like joint venture where someone may act as a potential, you know, prime contractor and have uh, subcontractors under them to help uh, actually, you know, produce products or perform services as well. So you have kind of have a variety. I often say, I think of it as teaming relationships, teaming together. And when you say teaming, you can be the joint venture. You can have that prime contract, a subcontractor relationship, or you can have a subcontractor who uses another subcontractor. So it's a, it's amazing to be all the different types that you can have. But what you're doing is you're coming together for a particular purpose. When I'm talking to people about teaming, I say, I don't know why people are often hesitant to team. I would like to have a little sliver of a big pie rather than 100% of zero, which I might have if I try to do it by myself. Amen to that, Karen. (laughs) In fact, I told my team that my word for this year, 2024, is partnerships. My philosophy is 10% of something is better than 100% of nothing. You can do more together than you can individually. Get your pride or ego out of the way and explore partnerships. That's exactly right. Karen, I'm sure there is someone listening who may be thinking, what do you call the actual contract when you find an entity that you want to partner or team with? Is it called a teaming agreement contract? Oftentimes, you know, for instance, here we have when we say a teaming arrangement, a teaming agreement, you know, it might be called that, you know, if that's what the parties desire to call it. Or, hey, it might be called a joint venture agreement. Right. If that's how the partners desire or where you have um, the, uh, you know, the prime contractor, subcontractor relationship, it could be like an independent contract agreement. A lot of times. I tell my uh, clients, don't necessarily get caught up in what you call the agreement. What we need to make sure of is what those are, what terms are in that agreement and make sure that they end up being mutually beneficial for both parties. And when I say mutually beneficial, please understand I'm not saying that it has to be 50-50 you know, all the way through, you know, the benefits need to be fit. No, that's not saying that's when you say mutually beneficial, sometimes that mutual benefit benefit might be 90% for one party, 10% of the other, but you are benefiting from it in some way, shape, form or fashion. That's what our teaming agreement looks like here at Equilibria. We are partnering with other organizations that have relationships in the U.S. federal government and large corporate enterprise spaces that we don't have. When we submit proposals, they will act as the prime contractor taking a management fee and Equilibria will act as the subcontractor getting the remainder of the fees. 
and it's taken a while to work through the mechanics of the contract. I know not all situations are the same, but Karen, can you explain the generic process for constructing a teaming agreement for your clients? I always like to have initial discussions with my clients so that I can understand what is it? What are their goals regarding whatever it is when we say this teaming relationship? What are the goals in it? And then, you know, what also thinking through, will there be, you know, will you keep your entity? They keep their entity. You're coming together just to be able to perform or to produce certain things. Or will it be that you will have a totally separate legal entity and we go through the formal process of actually forming that entity and when we do that are you going to own it in your individual capacities or will you own it if you already have an existing entity and that entity will end up being the owner those are very important things because we want to make sure of who are going to be the legally binding parties of that particular arrangement because we want to make sure that that is crystal clear up front so that you know everybody can be on one accord about it and i often will tell uh, my clients when they are doing this make sure that you have had this discussions with your business tax accountant regarding these matters, because, you know, whenever you're talking about entity formation and, and even with these particular relationships, make sure your accountant is aware of this so that they can maybe give you some best practices and best strategies for how you would enter into this relationship so that it can be mutually beneficial for you tax wise, because, I, you know, usually what we're talking about here are for profit entities and these for profit entities are trying to make profit and you want to make profit by trying to minimize your tax liabilities and other liabilities. So I think it's always so key to make sure that you talk with your business tax accountant and have them on board with what you're doing so that you can you know have a good firm foundation going forward and a good strategy for entering into these relationships. And I can speak from experience. Please heed Karen's warning. Always check with your tax accountant whenever you make any change to the way your business operates. For example, we had to change our classification from an S corporation to a C corporation this year due to operational changes that led us to making more money last year. That's a great thing, but it meant different tax implications. Sorry for that diversion. <laughs> Please, Karen, continue. And so once you have that done, then I know often my clients kind of look at me sideways when I mention, let's talk about how we're going to terminate this relationship. And they're like, terminate? <laughs> we are just talking about getting started. Yes. <laughs> but we want to talk about that on the front end when everybody is super excited about the perceived pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. We want to make sure that everybody is clear that, because understand that everybody, you know, every individual does not agree on everything. I don't care how good friends you are or that it might be a familial relationship. It's just certain things you may not agree on. And sometimes you may not know about these individuals or the entity strategies until you're in the trenches working with them side by side on a daily basis. And it may be that just your styles do not mesh. It may be that they are not doing anything illegal, immoral, or unethical. It's just like, um, I don't like that. You know, I like to, I like to do this something this way, and I like to do this one this way. So have a way out for that. Make sure and everybody be clear on that way out before you ever enter into it. But if I say this isn't really working for me and according to what we agreed upon and we have it in our agreement is that if I give you written notice, then it's at 30 days after that it's over, you know, and then of course uh, we want to make sure that we have addressed do they do they get any monies that, you know, if they get capital contributions, you want to know that up front, you know, so that everybody is clear if it's going to terminate 
what is going to happen. Like I said, I've seen it too many times where people or entities didn't address that up front. And then it's a nightmare when this is not working. What is it that we should do? And, you know, when people are often upset with each other, it's definitely hard for them to agree to let's let's part ways this way, you know, so let's do it when everybody is happy. That makes a lot of sense. We have an expression here in America, laying your cards out on the table. In other words, address how to handle issues up front. Because this is the Business Infrastructure Podcast, we focus on the people, processes, and tools required to scale operations. Karen, so far you've told us about some initial questions you ask your clients to start the process of drafting a teaming agreement. I know you have a very detailed list of questions that you share. These are questions about things you would never even think of, but it's better to think of those things ahead of time and work it into your teaming agreement, right? Yes, that's exactly right. For instance, so if it say, say intellectual property is involved and when I say that, are we talking about someone that has patent rights or any copyrights or any trademarks, things like that, who owns it? That intellectual property, is it going to be assigned to whatever the teaming relationship is going to be or is it going to remain the property of whoever it is that's contributing to it who has and and if it's in the early stages who's going to pay for the development of it are there going to be licenses granted upon that what are the costs that are going to be associated with development and from what i understand these considerations can apply to other areas as well right you can substitute services or products for it. Think through what what will it take to be able to develop those items? You know, what are the costs? Who will market those? How's the pricing going to be determined? Let's think about budget because we all know it takes money to make money. And too often I see that the parties will decide as for as what is the initial capital contribution. But let's think about it. You know, we are all excited about the possibilities of people either purchasing our product or we're getting contracts for, you know, those goods or services. But it may take a while for you to ever actually achieve, you know, those first sales. So who's going to be contributing the additional capital if there's needed? And will that be a mandatory uh, contribution required? Or if it's not mandatory, is it, you know, will one individual be stuck having to fund everything? And can you withdraw capital? And if so, what are the requirements for that? You get to the point where there are profits, you know, how will those be divided? And we also have the time period where there may be losses. How are those going to be divided? Who's going to be responsible for the books and records of the organization during the teaming arrangement? Is it one party said they are going to provide the employees or independent contractors and then somebody else is supposed to do something else? They may be supplying equipment. You know, what will be the roles and responsibilities of each of the parties? And if those parties don't do what they say they're going to do, you know, actually breach what the obligations are, what's going to happen? Do they forfeit their rights in the company or, you know, what will be those penalties? What if somebody decides they want to terminate or withdraw from it? What is allowed regarding it? Will they receive any monies back? Is notice required? What happens? You know, what are those circumstances for which you want to allow that? How about if someone decides, oh, you know what? I want to sell my interest in the um, teaming arrangement. Well, do you want it to be such that um, the other party, the non-selling party, do they get a right of first refusal regarding um, that particular member's interest or what happens? What happens if people die or, you know, become disabled? Let's think through how, what are some of those scenarios? What happens? Wow. 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 This is what I alluded to earlier. There are so many things to consider. Karen, earlier you mentioned the protection of intellectual property. But what about the protection of confidential information? 
when you're in a teaming arrangement, typically you are going to be probably sharing some very confidential information regarding your pricing, your product, you know, your clients, your vendors, your suppliers. They're getting exposed to your employees and your independent contractors. Are you going to make sure that you have restrictive covenants regarding non-competition as well as non-solicitations that they won't be able to um, solicit your customers? your clients or your employees um, think through those what if there is a breach of a of a warranty of a or a particular obligation and um, indemnification is going to be required because but for your actions now I'm being sued so should I be indemnified for that because of your actions and all can people use subcontractors or not and if so would they need your permission in order to be able to do this? So, you know, those are just a few of the many things that you often think about when you are forming these particular relationships. It's clear that a solid teaming agreement requires much customization. Is it possible for people to go online to get a generic agreement? I don't hate on the concept of just pulling a form online. However, you need to make sure that you read that contract from in its entirety. I mean, from every word from beginning to end, because you really need to understand those terms and conditions because each item, every word counts and each of those provisions matter, you know, and don't ever overlook things just like, boil, you know, those uh, provisions that are typically towards the end of the contract where people say, oh, a miscellaneous provisions, a boilerplate, you know, that might be one that has governing law. People might say, oh, that doesn't matter. It's just whatever state. Well, let me tell you when it does matter, because if it is problematic and you know, that litigation is required. Now, here you are, You maybe you partnered up with an, and teamed with an organization or entity that's based out of California and you let California law govern. Well, and then you're going to be subject to jurisdiction maybe in California. Well, now you're here in Georgia, so that means you're likely going to have to obtain uh, California counsel and may have to appear there. So that means flights to California. So think through those provisions when you, you know, when you are in those early negotiation stages. What are the long-term effects of some of these things? They're not just words on paper because these things can really impact your life and, you know, and, and they can be very time consuming. <laughs> this has my head spinning. I don't want anyone to walk away from this interview being scared because knowledge is power. If we circle back to your contract drafting process, once you've reviewed that robust list of questions you have with your clients, <clears throat> you then provide an initial draft of the contract. Again, from experience in working with you, I know that there can be several iterations of that contract based on further discussions. But once it's finalized, your client is free to send that contract to the other entity. Are there times when even more iterations to the contract may be required due to pushback from the other entity? Oh, yes, in a major way, because it depends on like who I'm representing. If, you know, we got company A and company B and I'm representing company A and company A has been charged with turning the initial draft of the document. And when you're going to submit it to, you know, company B for review, well, I'm representing company A. So I'm going to make sure that all of the terms are typically going to be favorable to company A and it's up to company B or its counsel to actually review it and determine what of that agreement is problematic to them. It is not company A or company A's lawyer's responsibility to tell you what's wrong with that contract and why it doesn't benefit you. That's not how it works. And I often tell people that all, <laughs> all the time, do not, when you receive a contract, from the opposing party, you should expect for it to be one sided in favor of the party that is delivering the contract to you. That's your job, your duty, your responsibility to review that contract and let them know what's problematic. And yes, I, it happens quite often. And they say, you know, because of course, if I send it over where indemnification might be just unilateral, you know, in favor of my client, I, I would expect that 
especially with the teaming of relationship, you're like, no, 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 it needs to be mutual or, you know, where that you have to indemnify us as we indemnify you. I mean, so I would definitely expect that. I always remember when it comes to, especially written agreements, they are made to be modified. Contracts are made to be amended. I have more respect for you if you tell me you don't want to amend it, but don't tell me it can't be. So, you know, I'm going to draft the, in such a way that I also want to make sure that it's fair and I'm going to follow your lead on all of that because if we receive it from the other side and they have some changes and, and it, you know, those that seem to be pretty reasonable and that you are okay with because we will walk through those and I will talk about, you know, what are the consequences of making those changes. And if you feel like these things are fair, we can include them. Those that we think are not fair, then we say that. And that's when we have to understand, you know, like, well, is this one of those what you might consider a deal killer where, you know, if they don't want to, you know, do X, then it's a no go. But I think we also have to think through what are those scenarios that will cause that particular thing to occur. But most of the time expect for yes, other po- opposing party will have certain comments, certain things that they want changed. And that's just the normal process of uh, negotiations in these teaming relationships. At this point, we've covered the process element of business infrastructure. What about the people element? You mentioned working with a tax accountant and obviously an attorney like you, but what exactly should we look for in an attorney? What would be that person's title? Somebody that usually dealing with corporate transactional related projects, or they say a contracts attorney, you know, and and sometimes when you you hear people that use the term business attorney, but, you know, you kind of, you know, nailed it down a little bit more to find out, okay, do you have experience with drafting, you know, certain types of agreements? And then that's when you would, you know, find out that kind of information and determine if that is uh, the right trusted advisor for you. And what about the tools and technology element of business infrastructure? You know, the whole uh, Microsoft suite. And then, you know, sometimes, of course, you're using the services that they have to be able to share documents back and forth. That might be much easier and you can do those and you can secure those as well. That's about it that I utilize, if that makes sense. Another tool is that infamous checklist of questions you present to your clients. Do you have that available in an online format that can be shared? Well, I actually don't have it up. I just usually what happens is when I usually offer like a free 15 minute discovery session, potential client, and I follow up by sending them a copy of it. So that's how I usually kind of keep control of it. Protecting your own IP. I love it. Karen, where can people find more information about you and your companies? At the end of 2022, I formed the consulting firm Gimos LLC. And the reason why I formed um, the consulting firm is because when I would approach very large organizations who have great uh, and very huge uh, constituency base, I would approach them about trying to provide educational training regarding contracts you know, these teaming arrangements, because, you know, over these 25 years of just seeing what things entrepreneurs and business owners don't know and trying to, because everybody's not necessarily ready for legal. Mm -hmm. I wasn't trying to approach them to promote my law firm. I just want to do the training through the law firm. So I formed my consulting firm so that now that's where I do my training. And one of the things that I created uh, as part of this consulting firm, I created an online membership-based community and it's called Practically Legal Lifestyle. And that name came about twofold. Um, I was talking with another colleague about the DIYers out here um, who are doing things themselves, don't know really what they're doing, and they're practically legal. And the other side of it is that we understand and recognize that business owners and entrepreneurs, they need practical legal and business information, because when you seem to understand those things in a practical way, you're like, oh, I get it now. I get it why I need to talk about termination before I enter into things. 
Well, everything you are doing to support the small business community in legal education and contract formation is much appreciated. Karen, as we wrap up, do you have any final words of wisdom regarding teaming agreements and growth strategies? Okay, I I would say a few things here. Trust, but verify. I understand that we, because we're trusting by nature, um, but it, you need to verify all of the information that someone is sharing with you. And keep in mind, people of integrity and good character will never have a problem putting what they say in writing. So if ever you find an individual or entity that's hesitant to put what they're telling you verbally in writing, that ought to raise a red flag. And then finally, please understand, you know, the courts are full of people who they were trusting of each other, right? But now they're in the midst of litigation. And, you know, because things turn bad and they typically turn bad very quickly, don't be flattered by people and entities that want to do business with you because sometimes they're actually looking for their next victim and that you might be it. You might be it because you're not going to review the contract. You're going to believe everything they say and not verify it yourself. So you end up being the next victim. They make all kinds of money off of you and they know that typically you might not have the resources to be able to pursue a litigation action uh, against them. And so now they've just made free, you've done free work and they uh, have just gained all access to those things and you were trusting of them. So well, I wanna make sure you understand, please don't be the next victim. Well, on that note, Karen, I cannot thank you enough for coming back onto the show, sharing all of these pearls of wisdom. This was fantastic. Thank you for having me and you have been a good friend and a great client. So if ever you need me back, I'm here to be able to educate, equip and empower. Thank you for that, Karen. And thank you for listening. If you'd like to connect with Karen, then be sure to visit businessinfrastructure.tv. There we'll have a link to her LinkedIn profile, as well as her online community and an upcoming workshop she's giving on patent protection. Again, you can find this information in the show notes at businessinfrastructure.tv. Join me in the next episode where I'll share how we here at Equilibria worked with Karen to develop teaming agreements based on key strategic partnerships outlined in our X matrix and project plans. Be sure to come back to the place wherever you're listening so you don't miss this next episode. Until then, remember to stay focused and be encouraged. This entrepreneurial journey is a marathon and not a sprint. Make sure you subscribe, click the notification bell so that you don't miss when that episode drops, and I'll see you in that next video.